Welcome to the South Asian Environment Dialogue uh, program, a weekly program of the Climate Channel Canada, along with the Plurals India and the No TV Bangla major YouTube channel in Bangladesh. And uh, this is a program, this is a platform, a media platform where we discuss various critical, important issues of South Asia regarding environment, climate change, and uh, as well as development sector. And at this point of time, nothing is bigger than the IPCC report that came up a few days back. It kind of shook the world in a way, as, as, as Guardian put it up, uh, it's, it's referring to the starkest hour for the world. So this IPCC report and uh, how, what it means actually, what it means and uh, what we, is, are the major takeaways of the report and uh, how this report is going to impact the geopolitics of the, not only the region of South Asia, but globally as well. We'll be, we'll be discussing all these things today. And uh, as we all know, as we all know that this is a report, uh, this is the working group one report of uh, six assessment report that they are, they are six of IPCC. And there'll be another couple of reports will be coming up uh, after some months. And this is a report on the physical uh, part of it, physical basis uh, report. And uh, uh, if I'm not uh, kind of given proper research input, about 234 researchers and scientists from 66 countries have used 14,000 14, documents, peer reviewed documents to come up with a report, which is about 4,000 pages. And it has been approved, very important word, I think it has been approved line by line by 195 countries. Uh, and now this report is in front of all of us. And as I said, that Guardian has put it up as the starkest warning yet. Uh, Boris Johnson, the UK uh, Premier said that this decade is going to be an extremely important decade for the mankind. Uh, and, and nobody less than the Secretary General of UN said, it's code rate for humanity. And that underlines the impact and importance of this great report. So we have a great, great panel uh, to, to talk about these agendas. Let me introduce the panel to all of you. I have with me uh, Dr. Shubhimal Ghosh from IIT Bombay, and he also happens to be uh, the lead author, one of the lead authors of the report, uh, if I'm not wrong, the chapter 11 of the report. Welcome, welcome Dr. Ghosh to the show. Looking forward to your input. Welcome, Dr. Ghosh. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Great, great to have you. I have with me Dr. A.K.M. Saiful Islam from Bangladesh, from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, a water expert, and he has been uh, a lead author from the chapter 12, also part of the uh, report that we prepared for the policymakers and the technical review. Welcome, welcome Dr. Islam. It's a great to have you in the panel. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me. It's such a pleasure. Uh, I have with me my very good friend, Sanjay Basist. Uh, Sanjay is the director uh, of the Climate Action Network South Asia, an extremely important uh, part of the civil society voice. Uh, Sanjay, as usual, nothing more to say. You are almost part of the program. So welcome to the show again. Thank you, Janta. Look forward. Great to have you. We are going to have a great uh, discussion. Another good friend of mine, another couple of good friends of mine, Ulka Kelkar. Ulka is the director of uh, climate program of the World Resource uh, Institute India. And Ulka is another very important part of this research from, uh, from the voice, the societal voice. Uh, Ulka, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me to this Great. show. And finally, I have with me Imran, Imran Saqib Khalid. Imran is the director of WWF, a specialized person on the climate change. And again, Imran, I had the opportunity of hosting Imran a couple of times. And he's one of the few people who really called me up, said that Jananda, you, you should take up this issue in the, your next program. So. Thank you, Imran, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Absolutely great. So let, let's not waste any more time and let's get on with it. And let me start with, with, with Dr. Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh, let's in the first round of this kind of uh, queries. What exactly, what are the major, major points of this report in general to you? Uh, thanks. I think, first of all, I'd like to mention that when you're talking about IPCC assessment report, is we are not really going for a new observation or new scientific analysis. Sure. So IPCC means it's an assessment report. So what is being done 
over uh, our year five was around 2012 so over the last eight or nine years with the peer reviewed literature peer reviewed scientific literature we scientists or we ipcc lead authors and contributing authors we assess them and based on that we say that well this is what is happening or this will happen probably in future with this much of confidence so there are confidence like low confidence medium confidence high confidence and within high confidence again we have likely and virtually certain so these are these are these are ipcc guidelines or ipcc terminologies now what ipcc assessment report 6 is telling so let us try to understand from the very first ipcc uh, assessment report to ipcc assessment report 6 if you go to assessment report 1 where we are try we ipcc try to say that probably uh, human greenhouse gas emission is one of the contributor to global warming now we are at ipcc year 6 where we are saying that it's very likely or it's almost certain that the greenhouse gas emissions by human being is the main contributor to the warming or global warming is attributed to human emission of carbon uh, carbon dioxide emissions by human that's the first thing the second thing is that it's virtually certain that the global warming has been taken place and it is irreversible that means uh, the carbon dioxide has a the, i mean i'll just explain it so carbon dioxide has a longer life span mm-hmm. so let's say if today we stop the greenhouse gas emission but we cannot really stop the warming the warming will continue and by 2040 we'll have 1.5 degree centigrade warming in warming condition which is kind of a very severe thing that shows that sorry sorry to sort of interrupt you because as because you just said the 2040 is a bit of a confusion because uh, in some part of the report is mentioned that couple of decades hmm. but in another part uh, which i used it's been it's been written that 1.5 degree will be We will be reaching 1.5 degree rise in 2030s. So mm-hmm. 2030s does not necessarily mean 2040. So uh, just will you be just kind of clarify what exactly is the point where we yes. expect 1.5 to rise? Business as usual. Yes, I, I'll, I'll tell. So it depends on different scenarios. So whenever we are talking about the future scenario, it's kind of a projected scenario. I, I'll just give a quick example. Let's say when you see the cricket match. around 30 overs let's say it's a 50 over match around 30 over it says that if for the next 20 overs if the net and if the run rate will be 6 per over this will be the projected score if the, if it is 8 per over this will be the projected score in the same way there are different scenarios different emission scenarios based on which there are rcp scenarios so sure. these they are known as representative concentration pathways so the, if you change the scenarios a worst scenario will result in a faster reaching of the Uh, warming 1.5 level. Uh, 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 let's, just... Dr. Gos, let's for the time being just kind of we'll be kind of discussing all this in that length. But let's sort of find the, for the time being what are the exact to the report as a lead author and as a scientist looking up to the whole thing. What are the main main points you think yes. are extremely relevant? Just if you mention the points, yeah. then we bring around. Yeah, the the, the the second thing is that uh, first one is global warming has been taking sure. place and sure. it is it will take it will continue. even if we stop the greenhouse gas emission at least for next two or three decades it will continue sure the second one is that and the, there are few important points which are related to extremes the first one is that heat waves it is virtually certain that heat waves all over the globe has increased and it will continue to increase okay and unprecedented heat waves will take place in future with uh, rarer events occurrences will be more increase in occurrences will be more mm-hmm. now increase in heavy precipitation this has been increased over the past now it's a, and and there is a little bit of confidence now with with the, with the improved modeling performance because precipitation is not a very good variable by, to be modeled by the climate models but still with that we have a little bit of confidence that it is because of the global warming the third one is that uh, the compound extremes that means when you are talking about multiple extremes together that will and uh, that will increase in the future okay. the fourth one is that drought overall it's increasing but for south asian region of course there is a low confidence that's a different story but overall there is a increase in drought, drought will be increasing yes great i think let let's let's kind of uh, at this point of time let's start discussing yes. with it then we'll come to other points uh, dr islam uh, yeah. the points yeah. that dr ghosh yeah. has been making the main pointers uh, along with that what according to you are the major major important agendas and takeaways from this last ipcc Uh, WG1 report. 
thank you, uh, Mr. Boshu. Uh, I think already uh, Professor Shubhimal Bosh mentioned some of the key points. I just like to echo with him and uh, compliment some of the additional points. First of all, uh, this assessment report, as Shubhimal made, that we are now certain that univocally certain, there is no doubt that human influence actually causing these changes in the atmosphere and ocean and land. And recent change uh, of climate is widespread, rapid, and intensifying over the thousands years. Around 2000 years, such warming was never happened. It was unprecedented. This is the first point. Second is there are a couple of things that uh, has been observed. For example, uh, CO2 is highest in two million years. And sea level rise is fastest rate than over the last 3000 years. And Arctic sea ice extent is lowest uh, last 1000 years. And glacier retreat is unprecedented over 2000 years. Uh, Shubhimal already mentioned about the extremes that uh, extreme heat will be more frequent and intense. Heavy rainfall in general will be more frequent and intense. Drought, he mentioned, that will be intense in some reasons. And fire weather, that recently we are seeing fire weather in Turkey, we are seeing Greece, that will be more frequent in the future. And also, we see that ocean has uh, going through many changes, such as it will be more warm, it will be acidified because of absorbing CO2, and it is losing oxygen. And sea level rise is continue to rise, that uh, Professor Ghosh mentioned that it, some processes, that even the stop of the greenhouse gas will not stop. Okay. Okay. One of the processes is ice sheet melting and uh, sea level rise, and this kind of process, uh, even oxygen depletion of the ocean, that will continue. So these reports confirm the previous assessment with more certainty tone, high confidence, sometimes virtually certain, that world is changing and climate is changing and because of the human activity. So okay. this is the main thing. This is the main part. Okay. Yeah. I mean, great. And we'll, we'll be discussing about what are the new areas which have come up in this report compared mm -hmm. to Air 5. Uh, also what it means for South Asia. But before that, let me let me go to Sanjay. Sanjay, whatever these two scientists, two lead authors have spoken for last five, 10 minutes, 10 minutes about this report, I put it in one word, inhabitable. The world is turning inhabitable. That's a single word that sums up everything. But Islam was pointing out that everything is at the worst in thousand years. But Ghosh was also talking about that. So as a, as a civil society expert and activist. And the fact that this report has been accepted by all the countries, it has been only released after the countries ratified it. How do you see this report influencing the climate geopolitics in near future? Well, uh, I think, Janta, let's not be very excited about Air 6, uh, because I think, uh, you know, there is a saying about shoot the messenger. Um, what we have been doing last uh, 50, 60 years has been, we have been ignoring the messenger. This is the sixth message from IPCC and IPCC has been the messenger that what future holds for you if you don't do anything, even in terms of action, uh, what you'll be able to save and the cost of inaction, uh, both has been um, you know, put forward. So of course um, uh, we have been ignoring, politics has been ignoring the messenger, unfortunately. Now uh, you said that all countries have agreed, uh, I would not agree completely with it, primarily because if you look at 142 pages of summary for policymakers and look at 3,942 pages of full text, uh, the very important part I saw when I was going through both documents and I compared, I saw that carbon budget has been mentioned in 3,942 pages. It's not mentioned in 142 pages. So in a way, any scientific uh, calculations that would have pressurized uh, uh, countries, especially those who are historically responsible, it has been omitted. So certainly, you know, on is, AR6... Is, 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 by design? Design? is by design, you feel? It's by negotiations. That's is what they do. It's by negotiations. Countries have negotiated 
and they have asked that this not to be considered. Imagine if carbon budget reflects in the uh, summary for policymakers, which is a reference document for everyday negotiations during COPs and substars and other intersessionals, uh, the pressure on developed countries will be very high. Um, so, so certainly, uh, you know, the all the possible pressure has been, um, you know, uh, has been diffused uh, already in, in the SPM. Now, uh, the good part of AR6 is, you know, I normally use an analogy and say that earlier we had X-ray, now we have done MRI. It is certainly very specific, Asia specific. There is an interactive tool. So certainly congratulations, Dr. Islam, Dr. Absolutely. for a wonderful report that you have come out. There is an interactive so, uh, uh, atlas also that we can use. And that means earlier our... Uh, uh, adaptation response used to be generic. Now it is very specific to the area, and that would mean we can calculate the cost of means of implementation in terms of technology, in terms of cl climate finance. We can also ca uh, ca uh, calculate uh, how disaster risk reduction response needs to be made. So as a civil society, we have a long fight to go for. We have to really bring in the main science into the negotiations, and the science should be guiding the negotiations. So I'll be coming back to you, but just a passing question that do you feel that this report, as you said, is one of the better reports, much more details, very specific. Indeed. Really, I'd like to congratulate both the lead authors here. Yeah. You've done a yeah. wonderful job. I think all these 236 uh, scientists have done a wonderful job. And I have rarely seen the, uh, the report for policymakers so in a so lucid language. Yeah. Uh, normally, there's a lot of jargons and everything going around, but this is yeah. a report where actually you have been on the point. So really congratulations on that. But yeah. uh, do you think, Sanjay, that it has given you uh, the people like you, uh, more ammunition to counter the governments on the Absolutely. climate front? Absolutely. It has certainly given more. In fact, I would, I'm waiting for working group three because that will help me to hold developed countries accountable because on one side, if they're talking about uh, a reduction or phase out of uh, fossil fuel, they are actually investing more. The, the calculations show uh, different pictures. Second... Uh, uh, the uh, adaptation, uh, whether the adapt working group two report, that would be more on adaptation, whether our intervention has okay. been enough or we are just doing a cosmetic changes and we are feeling happy about it. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, so, so a lot of ammunition, a lot of ammunition to fight on. Uh, Ulka, what your take on that? How do you feel that really it gives you a stronger ammunition and how you see in general, how hopeful you are? You are a hopeful person, I know. How hopeful you are to kind of uh, uh, to, to see this report making penetration because I I'm, I see a corollary before this before the Copenhagen Climate Conference when actually the world acknowledged the climate change in a way in a, in a much bigger way uh, the report I think that was that was AR four report uh, the whole world took cognizance of that and then exactly everybody kind of kind of uh, saw that report and saw the impact. So you feel a similar kind of scenario, this AR6 report is going to start up the Glasgow conversation to a certain extent? So I actually go back even further in history to when the IPCC was set up. Sure. If you recall in the 1980s, there was a series of droughts and you know heat waves in the US, which were for that time unprecedented. Uh, at that time, it actually led uh, to the setting up of the IPCC that something is happening with the planet, we need to study it. So I do feel that this report, I mean, it has got a lot of media attention all over the world. But more importantly, it has come right back to back with these extreme weather events that are being recorded on people's cell phones. So, you know, you have that video of tourists leaving from an island in Greece, and the entire sky is red as these forests are being burnt down. And immediately it is being shared on social media. So this is now no longer something where climate change will happen 100 years down the future. And we are trying to get people to care about something that will affect their grandchildren. This is now something that, that is confirming, this report is confirming what we are seeing with our own eyes. Uh, so I think the attribution science that became very strong in recent years and which was able to say that this particular event has become this much more likely due to climate change. Um, these wildfires would have been virtually impossible. Uh, this heat wave in Northern America would have been virtually impossible without climate change. I think those news reports are, are, have been extremely hard to ignore. And that's why the IPCC report that has just come out is really only confirming that. So, so I think uh, it does put in the hands of you know, uh, activists like Sanjay, 
as well as people in government who really do want to do more, the scientific evidence, uh, you know, that this is uh, incontrovertible. Uh, I just wanted to refer a little bit to the point that Sanjay made about the carbon budget, because actually, if you see the summary for policymakers right at the end, there is a table okay. that talks about the carbon budget, not country by country, no. but for the world as a whole. And one thing it tells you very clearly is that uh, in the next 10 years, we will blow through the global carbon budget for staying within 1.45 degrees Celsius. So it's, it's really difficult. If you also look at what the remaining carbon budget is for 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, and you look at what India's fair share will be, that's the point that Sanjay is making. We are very much entitled to a, you know, to a large share of that carbon budget. So that's irrefutable that we deserve a fair share. The question now for policymakers is, will we use it? How much of it we want to use? That, what does it a, mean? What does Absolutely. it mean for Bangladesh, for small island developing states? That's Absolutely. a geopolitics think, uh, that, quite complicated. Do they, do they see, there are, there are big words. Boris Johnson saying that this decade is the critical one. Somebody saying, Secretary General, even saying that this is a code rate. But will they, will they walk, talk? That's the whole point. Let's go to Imran. Imran, what's your take on that? You have been through this. We have been hearing this, uh, I would say, glowing words about climate change and what the government should do, what the world should do. We have been hearing all this from the political leaders. But this report is very clearly showing we are running out of time. So, Imran, what do you think? Will it really, really push it more than it has been pushing so far, Imran? Yeah, th thank you, Jayanta. So, uh, uh, let's start with running out of time. Running out of time for whom? There are many people in this world who will argue that, you know, they're already being hurt immensely by what's happening. Sure. They've, we've run, they've run out of time. Mm -hmm. They've run out of space. Yeah. They've run out of uh, space. Uh, to live, you know, they're moving. People are migrating uh, across Pakistan, across India, across across the world. This is already happening. Climate change is first and foremost a social justice issue, right? It's affecting those of us who do not have the means to adapt to the challenges posed by it. So, hence, my question is, what is this report going to do that the others were not able to achieve? Mm. I mean. Is what's the big difference, right? So yes, scientifically we can we, we can talk about uh, the, the the last AR five talk is saying that look, uh, climate change. There's a 90, 95 to a hundred. Uh, there's a chance that 90, uh, 95 percent to hundred percent of scientists believe that climate change is anthropogenic in nature. Versus this report saying climate change is unequivocally, you know, uh, human induced. What's the difference? I mean, today that yes. we're, we're here talking about this, we, we, were, we were here, uh, you know, talking about the same uh, way when, when the, the previous report came out and the, and the one before that. In fact, for the past 20 years, scientists have been highlighting the need to address these challenges. What's not been happening is uh, we haven't done anything vis-a-vis -vis adaptation. We haven't done anything vis-a-vis -vis mitigation. So the physical science has been, it's, it's right, it's, it's spot on and it's, and, it, and it's built on scientific evidence uh, that dates back to 1970s. But, but you're saying that this is not really making inroads into the policymaking decision of the people who matter. So, no, no, no. It's in fact, in fact, uh, do you know that China is embarking on a plan to uh, introduce new coal power plants? Uh, in, in Pakistan, we are relying on coal. India has done the same thing. Uh, uh, the, the U.S. does not. You know, we are talking about carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, why aren't we bringing that closer to around 2030? So, yes, uh, I think, I think very, some very of the questions that point. we really need to talk about. Absolutely. I think, I think uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh, let us very quickly go to the science part of it. You are a scientist, so uh, you are not the persons to talk about the politics part of it, but I know. But again, sometimes science and politics, they overlay each with other. Uh, what uh, Imran was just saying, two very important takeaways from Imran and also Sanjay and Ulta's uh, uh, kind of observation. First of all, that uh, yes, there are maybe stronger words being used. As you said, AR1 say, likely. And then I'll say most probably. So they're playing with this kind of playing with the words kind of thing. 
Yes, a very strong report, categorical report, but not much decision-wise difference that we find. So that is one part of it. But what I'm asking you is more specifically, you said, uh, say for example, take India. Uh, you were talking about the heat webs. Uh, in Indian context, what are the main pointers this report is showing? Uh, India and maybe the South Asian countries around, what are the main pointers? Let we understand them, then we can understand that what the countries are doing politically to comprehend Dr. Ghosh. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think, uh, first of all, I really thank you know, uh, Mr. Imran for raising a very important point, actually. So, uh, yes, I think what uh, Working Group 1 provides is that the scientific facts and working group two and three are providing the adaptation and mitigation options. So I'm also looking forward to seeing the working group two and three uh, reports and in what way they are actually adding value to the different countries' policies Absolutely. and also to the policy of different stakeholders, which are very, very important at this moment because just stopping at, just, you know, talking about the problem will not really solve the problem. And uh, so that will, that will not add value if you will not find out the solution. I fully agree with you. And we need actually, we need to see what working group two and working group three are coming up with. Now coming to South Asia. So one of the very important part of working um, uh, year six report is that it has given the very nice regional assessment, which was not there in previous uh, yes. in assessment reports. So this is one of the very important point of assessment report six. And for each of the chapters, many of the chapters, we have given the regional fact sheets. So we have the regional fact sheets for, uh, for different things and also regional tables are provided, specifically 10, 11, and 12. 12, Saiful was the lead author for 12, I was for 11 and for chapter 10, many of our colleagues were there. And we actually tried to provide the regional assessments, which is, which is kind of different. And, uh, taking that you know point, so if you are considering the regional assessment for South Asia, so there are a few things which have come out. I'll just list them quickly. The first one is that heat waves have increased and will increase. This is almost virtually certain. The second one is heavy precipitation. Heavy precipitation has increased, and it will continue to increase. And uh, but there are limited evidence that. It say, that talks about that this increase in heavy precipitation is attributed to the human-induced GHG emissions because we do not have much data and much model uh, output, but much analysis. It says that heavy precipitation has increased and it will increase. So these are the first two things. The third thing about monsoon. Monsoon is one of the very important thing. So it is being mentioned that the Indian monsoon or the South Asian monsoon have reduced over the last 50 or last 100 years. And uh, it is being mentioned, it is not because of greenhouse gas emissions. It is very clearly mentioned in the IPCC report that it is because of the pollution. It is because of the, um, it is because of the aerosol. aerosols. Because aerosols normally results into a cooling effect over the Indian landmass, I mean, Indian subcontinental landmass, and because of which land to ocean thermal contrast gets reduced and monsoon wind gets declined. But the models are showing increase in the monsoon rainfall for future projections. And IPCC has made a very nice assessment here. But IPCC has very clearly said and very categorically said that models do not have confidence and models do not have very good performance for South Asian monsoon. Neither the uh, global models nor their regional components. It's a very critically, very careful, I mean, uh, very carefully mentioned in the IPCC, specifically chapter 11. Very candid, has, very candid as well. Very candid as well. And then it was mentioned for the broad projections, whatever we are seeing that because the monsoon rainfall is increasing, draw, models are not capturing future increase in drought. And it was mentioned that this is what models are saying, but there we have a very low confidence because models have also shown over the last 50 or 100 years that monsoon rainfall have, will increase, but it has actually reduced because of the aerosol. So, so, so there are issues with monsoon so rainfall. These are the three points, okay. And, and there, there are, and the other, the other one was about, uh, of course, the glacier. The glacier retreats are kind of very, I mean, it's happening and it will increase the glacier melt and the snow melt will increase. And uh, Indian river basins, if you are considering the Himalayan river basins, the uh, Indus river basins over Pakistan, Bhambaputra, and uh, you know, the, all these river basins, the hydrology is very complex because there are rainfall chains, there are snow melt sure. chains. So it's very complex. So of course, there is not very high confidence in the assessments. And finally, of the complex... But, but, the, but the, the, sorry to interrupt you, may not be high assessment, 
high high kind of confidence but what generally they are talking about the reverse what are the general uh, whatever the confidence level is what are the general assessment so the general it's a general assessment it, it's actually a kind of a complex interplay between the rainfall change okay. between the snow melt change between the temperature change so so it doesn't give a proper direction it's it's unable to provide a proper direction i'm asking you because many of the rivers which we can see are turning from the kind of they're turning perennial river uh, yes. only the seasonal river they are no longer river throughout yes. the, so uh, will that trend continue yes of course if the glacier drift it will continue of course this trend will that continue will because great Uh, fine. As so, the uh, compound extends, uh, the last exactly. one is compound extends. Hmm. Compound extends means so we we know that both Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal they are warming at a very high rate, and because of that the tropical cyclones are increasing. When the tropical cyclones are increasing, the wind extends are increasing. With the wind extends, there are sea level rise, and at the same time the cyclones are bringing extreme rainfall. Extreme rainfalls are also increasing. So. Rainfall induced flood, coastal flood, sea level rise, as well all as wind, acting all all acting together, these will increase in the uh, in the coastal region of so, South Asia. So, so area like Sundarbans in uh, yes. West Bengal, India, or Sundarbans in Bangladesh, they are yes. going to be much affected for that. So, fair enough. I think uh, there are other issues that will come to you, but uh, let us uh, go to Dr. Islam. Dr. Islam, uh, you, you have worked in that particular area of urbanization. Uh, uh, Dr. Kose has just pointed out the broad. of south asian perspectives but uh, from the urbanization point of view i think this is the first time that urbanization relationship with the climate change has been highlighted in an ipcc report if i am not wrong so how you see it because you have been part of that you have been a lead author on that uh, so how our how our cities are going to be affected in in india in bangladesh in pakistan what's your take on that uh thank you actually uh, some of them already shubhibal uh, mentioned that uh, extreme uh, precipitation will increase and heat wave and extreme heat condition will be increased and uh, this is to mostly we suffer for any urban cities like uh, i'm currently in dhaka city we sometimes see all on a sudden huge amount of rainfall and it causes drainage congestion and urban flooding uh we saw prolonged heat wave and heat uh, uh heat condition particularly many indian city we see during the summer period they suffer from heat wave apart from that uh, this report actually emphasizes on the coastal uh, region already uh, professor shubhibal mentioned that compound events which uh, if cyclone occur we see level rise because of uh, cloud at Uh, atmosphere moisture holding capacity will increase even and too much evapotranspiration that means rainfall of the same cyclone will be more uh, precipitation in the in the future with the same cyclone that uh, currently we are facing so that means storm surge is coming from the sea uh, at the same time precipitation will be heavier that mean inland flooding so those kind of situation we see a last couple of cyclone in bangladesh coast and indian coast we see cyclone amphan er shoni uh, two super cyclones so this kind of event will be more frequent and particularly the proportion of category 3 to 5 cyclones which are very high cvr cyclone or super cyclone that will be increased even 4 degree warming will cause 30% increase of the extreme uh, cyclones coastal city uh, particularly you mentioned about sundarbans and uh, we, in bangladesh we have khulna and other uh, kolkata and other coastal cities that will going to suffer uh, sea level rise and coastal erosion uh, it will increase in the future and sea level rise is continue to increase and deep depends on the emission scenario that uh professor shubhimal mentioned because if you have a low emission scenario uh, then the rise will be not much but if you have a rcp 8.5 those kind of emission it will continue another 1000 years and this coastal area will not only sea level rise but also salinity that we are facing and the sundarban ecosystem one of the study of buet apart from ipcc report we we found that uh, sundarban area by 1 uh, meter sea level rise is cause 40% area will be under water because it's not uh, protected by embankment it's a natural system mangrove 
system. So coastal city will be most uh, most affected that uh, cities um, uh, section in that. This is any the any specific reference to Shundarban has been made in the report? Any uh, Indian Shundarban or Bangladesh Shundarban? Any specific references there? No, I don't see anything. But um, generally, see in generally uh, any coastal region. And uh, and Bay of Bengal, particularly Indian Ocean, tropical Indian Ocean, will be more faster warmed than other part of the uh, ocean. So these changes and uh, a couple of two other things I like to mention: ocean is reducing oxygen, and coral is breaching because of marine heat wave will be more frequent. Already we observe, and then acidification; those are actually uh, affected marine life and coastal uh, ecosystem. Uh, and cities which are uh, near the coast. Okay. So th these things will... This is the basic be... point. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, I'll come back to you uh, regarding this. Uh, you talked about the heat wave. I yeah. saw a chart, a map, where yeah. uh, many cities being mentioned about the amount of global warming that took place in the last many years. And I, I saw that Kolkata is one of the highest, followed by Tehran and all that. So I'll come to that. But before that, let, let's try to understand the uh, uh, again the implication uh, Shanjay, uh, you, you said about your, your expectation uh, in the Glasgow and all this coming up. But now, uh, don't you think that with this evidence being mounting up, up and up, uh, politicians across, especially the countries that they are be, now there is a very strong uh, kind of uh, word around going around the net zero. So uh, you feel these are the uh, kind of uh, uh, scenario or the positives or, 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 or kind of options that we can look at. Do you think that net zero is really an option or, or a doable thing, even like 100 like India? Yeah, well, I think uh, with respect to AR6, uh, there are some, uh, if there are some opportunities, like, you know, uh, polit political will um, needs to be higher. So they are under, certainly going to be under pressure. But uh, I think there are some uh, fears also. So let me share four or five points on that. I think one, certainly with AR6, very specific um, impact, uh, we can hold developed countries accountable that uh, you have to phase out now. Uh, there is no, uh, especially when we know that uh, whatever the forecast that AR5 made, they, for future, for 2030, are being observed now already. So, so certainly, so hold accountable uh, then. Then second is, and that's my fear, uh, that there will be very successful uh, effort to shift burden on victim countries. Mm. Uh, developed countries will shift their historic responsibility and everything on developing countries, and that's my fear. So that's where, as a civil society, we need to hold equity and common but differentiated responsibility principle as core. Uh, when we speak about, when we advocate for ambitious action by uh, countries. Uh, another fear is there will be push or uh, selling of false solutions. CCS is one among them. I mean, these are solutions which are still under laboratory, not yet proven, very costly. Um, certainly will give a lot of revenue if they are accepted by all, it will give a lot of revenue to uh, developed countries uh, researchers so they can take profit out of uh, distress. That's another thing. Then net zero, um, I think, is, is it is being interpreted in a different way. There is a net zero producers forum, which only talks about how we can continue burning fossil fuel and still, you know, co co basically promoting the false solutions there also. Um, so net zero uh, needs to be achieved more in the context of natural boundaries rather than artificial uh, technologies because every technology has a side effect. I think at the local level, what we need to do is we need to basically revamp disaster risk reduction. And AR6 will help us to do that because AR6 gives us very area specific local impact. And accordingly, we can design disaster risk reduction um, you know, tools which can uh, provide immediate relief. So this is how I see AR6 unfolding on uh, uh, CSO unfolding and on, on, on us and Yes, I think Ulka, what Shanjay has just mentioned, very interesting that uh, we had seen, we had we had the experience of seeing, say, how the whole AIDS movement uh, from a public health movement turned into a commercial movement. So mm -hmm. there's always been an effort to turn 
the the environmental movement, climate movement, to an economic movement. There's there's a group who's always saying that there's an economic solution to it. Yes, I understand that economy plays an uh, important cog in the wheel, but it can't be the wheel in itself. It COVID can't be the wheel in itself. So, so, yeah. so uh, you have similar fear, Ulka, that uh, that this this kind of report, yes, will trigger, but trigger in a wrong manner. I mean, I, uh, I appreciate the fears that Sanjay has articulated. I think even more there is disappointment because if you want the whole uh, problem to be solved by governments through public funding alone, for example, we have not seen that forthcoming, right? The climate finance $100 billion goal, initially the expectation was that it would be public money. Yes. Then, uh, you know, the expectation was it would be blended finance. Um, so I think what we have seen in recent years is the fact that renewable energy has become competitive with fossil fuels. Yes, absolutely. Um, there are now moves towards green hydrogen and, you know, kind of these sunrise industries of the future. Mm. There are market-based instruments like carbon pricing, which can play a powerful role in incentivizing shifts and in fact, in incentivizing the kind of research and development that requires these, you know, that is required to make these technologies cheaper. So being an economist, I do believe that the market has a role to play sure. and that in some sense, it also often reduces the burden on governments. It kind of softens and makes everybody involved in this. The problem that happens is when we have uh, finally this metric, which is GDP, which is the metric that determines the success of an economy. Um, and if you look at the policy levers that are required to achieve net zero or decarbonization or whatever, a big part of that is improving material efficiency. By material efficiency, I mean more recycling, more reuse of cement, steel, the minerals that we have you know, in our laptops and cell phones. Um, this is what we call circular economy. And when you reuse things that have already been produced rather than making new things, it actually has a negative effect on the GDP mm -hmm. because the GDP only measures production and sales. The moment you reduce production and start reusing and recycling, it actually shows that your GDP is slowing down. Mm -hmm. So that's the mindset that we need to get out of, that you can have a thriving economy, you can create jobs uh, without necessarily having excessive or overconsumption, particularly by the elite. So Absolutely. I would say uh, I would say there are there is definitely a role for market based solutions, but the danger is not only on the technology side. Danger is even on the consumption side, on the lifestyle side. Dangers are everywhere. Both sides. Both sides. Dangers are all sides. We need all, uh, sensible side. policies. Uh, Imran, uh, I'll come back to Sanjay very quickly after that because it's a very interesting provocation that Ulka has given me to ask. Start with Imran. Let's see where this we are all with this great scientist uh, with the report that we have right now with us. We understand that the world is warming up. This is an unequivocal uh, proof of that. And the, the and then and the emission needs to cut down. Now there are two ways of looking at it. I, I remember uh, Gopal Krishna Gandhi, uh, the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, once told he was the governor of West Bengal for some many years. And uh, I was privy to one of his uh, very closed door meeting where he was talking to a few bureaucrats and say, sometime, sometime you have to say no to development. He said that everybody around him was talking about, sir, we can manage it with better technology. Well, there will be emission or there will be environmental degradation, but we can manage it with better technology. He said, see, there's a limit to being managed. At some point of time, you have to say, no, we can't go beyond that. There's an equilibrium component to it. So my, my fear, Sanjay was talking about his fear, my fear with kind of looking at this scenario for about a decade or so, that there will be an effort within a part of, part of the governments around comes up with it to, to, to explore ways and means to marketize the process. So we won't be reducing emission, rather we'll be improving our technology to take care of that. So that's the kind of hunch I have. Imran, uh, first Imran, then 